I'm curious, are you enjoying the rest of Christmas? Are you enjoying the decorations? Are you enjoying the events? Are you enjoying the season? Are you enjoying the hustle and bustle? Are you enjoying any of it? Yes? Yes. Some. Okay. Well, I, I just want to make sure that you understand that if you're having a good time, if you're running here and there and doing this and that and enjoying the season, not everybody has an opportunity to do all the things that you're doing. And yes, I know sometimes you feel like you've got more things to do than you can, but there are some folks who don't get a chance to do much of that at all. And I'm thinking especially this morning of the folks in our church who we call shut-ins. They're not able to come and be here. They're not able to come and see the children sing. And so there is an event this afternoon that if you are enjoying Christmas, that will allow you to share your joy with the folks in our church family who can't be here. Now, as Brother Steve told you already, they're, they're, we're going to work the kids today and some of the families do. Uh, there, there is a rehearsal, the last rehearsal for the Wednesday night presentation. I'm looking forward to it. That was a great taste of it. But then later in the afternoon, at 4 o'clock, we are going to have a time of caroling this afternoon. And that is for our shut-in families. We've got a route mapped out that's going to carry us around to as many of them as possible. We're going to be riding uh, Brother Tim's uh, trailer. So this is a combination hayride and caroling and fellowship. Our, our kids are leading in this event. This is, is a, is, was originally a children's event, but it's open to everyone. And plus, we will need some adult help, this is a, a technical term, to corral children. You know what it means to corral children? It's kind of like herding cats. Y'all know how to do that. But we, if you're welcome. I just want you to understand, this is a church-wide event. We'll put as many folks on Brother Tim's trailer as we can and have a great afternoon. And then when we're done caroling, we'll come back to the church for hot chocolate and cookies. Brother C, this is where you say, hey. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. And, and so that's happening this afternoon. I want you to be aware of that. Be here about 3.45 or so. We'll start getting things together. We're going to try and pull out uh, not too long after 4 o'clock and, and get on the road with that because we'll try and do that before it gets too terribly dark and, and get back to the church. Also, one other announcement, I want to make sure that you are aware of this. Last Wednesday night, we had a family meeting to answer questions about next year's budget. If you did not get a chance to make that meeting, there are copies of the new budget for next year here on the table. I think our finance committee has done a great job of giving us a very manageable budget for next year. But if you've not yet gotten a copy of the budget, it's here on the table. Pick one up because next Sunday at the end of worship, we'll have a just a straight yes, no, up or down vote on the budget. So you need to know what you're voting on and the comments are right there. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. This is a story you know. But I'm going to try and put just a little bit of a new slam on it for you this morning. Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible, and you please follow along with whatever translation of God's Word that you have with you this morning. Matthew says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, magi, wise men, from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Herod didn't want to hear about a new king, so he was troubled. And Herod caused enough trouble that when he was troubled, Matthew's not kidding when he says, and all Jerusalem was troubled with him. So gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, Herod inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Is there anything in prophecy about this, boys? And they said, oh, yes. Verse 5, they said to him, 
in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, that you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, come back and report to me so that I may too come and worship him. Well, Herod wanted to get to see Jesus, but he didn't want to worship him. We, we find that out later. So verse 9 says, After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I love that sentence. It, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Do, do, you, do you get the mood for the wise men? It's joy. Uh, today is the third Sunday of, of Advent. When we leave today, we'll light the pink candle. This is the week of joy in the Advent season. And so this is a great passage. The attitude of the wise men was joy. They rejoice exceedingly with great joy. I, I think Matthew wants us to get that. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They fell to the ground and worshipped him. And then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. You've heard the old expression, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. Well, the passage today fits in that category. I think sometimes when we read the story of the wise men, we, we can't see the forest for the trees. And, and over the years, and I've been guilty of this myself, we have looked at the story of the wise men, and we've asked all about the individual trees. We've asked about all the details that we can think of about this very interesting story. We've asked how many wise men were there? Well, tradition says there were three because they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Although Syriac and Eastern Orthodox Christian churches insist that there were 12 wise men, but that, that's their interpretation. We, we've asked what were the names of the wise men? Well, tradition says that their names were Gaspar, Balthazar, and Melchior, who represented Arabia, Persia, and India. So it was all of the world, in a sense, coming to see Jesus. We've asked if they were actual kings. You know, we have that song, We Three Kings of Orient Art. Or if they were scholars and astronomers, probably the latter. We, we've asked how they knew to respond to the sighting of the new star. And I've even preached about that. I think it's a very interesting story. I think it's because their ancestors met Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar made him chief of the wise men. And I think Daniel told that group about an Old Testament prophecy of a star that would appear that would signal the birth of a new king. And we've asked, when did they actually arrive? Because you know they're in all the manger scenes. Sorry to disappoint. They probably were as late as two years after the manger scene when they got there. Uh, even though we, we just kind of ignore that when we do our modern day major scenes, and that's fine. But ultimately, what I want you to see this morning, all of those questions, all of those issues, how many were there, what were their names, uh, how did they find out, all of those issues are secondary. They're interesting, but they're secondary. They're even instructive, but they're secondary. When we talk about all of those issues about the wise men, we're looking at the trees, but we're missing the forest. We're missing the face value of the story. So I want to talk to you for just a little bit this morning about the face value, the, the, the obvious meaning of this story, the 
wise one. And I'll tell you where I think you see the face value of the story. Number one, you see it in the travel issue. These men made a trip, if they came from where we think they came from, it, they made a trip of 600 to 800 miles by an 80 mile a day max smelly camel. That means it took them at least, and I think probably more, but it took them at least 10 smelly days to get to Jesus. You ever been in a smelly car? Uh, when, when I went to Houston last week for the accreditation conference, I had my first ever, I'm, I'm almost 63 years old, I had my first ever Uber ride. <laughs> it was awesome. Scary. But awesome. I, I'm so thankful for Geneva and our traffic jams of two cars at a stop sign. Houston in an Uber. Y'all. And they don't let anybody drive through. I'm just telling you. Uh, but I, I made it. I'm back. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, but ten smelly days. You, you can see the face value in the bother. I, I mean, think about it. not only ten smelly days on the camel, but they had to bring enough food for the whole trip because there was no guarantee of a McDonald's anywhere. And so they had to pack the food, make the day's journey, stop somewhere, <coughs> unpack the camel, make camp, have supper, go to sleep, get up the next morning, repack the camel, and here we go again. They had to do that multiple times. There is, in the face value of the story, there is cost. Do you see in the story that these men did not come to Jesus empty-handed? They all came with gifts fit for a king. We, we talk a lot about the symbolism in the gifts, but the bottom line is they brought expensive gifts that were worthy of a king. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, a precious metal, and two precious spices. Not inexpensive gifts. You, you can see the face value in, in the attitude. The, these men did not come to Jesus in blasé, dispassionate, obligatory fashion. Verse 10, as I told you, I, I kind of camped out there when I was reading it, says they rejoice exceedingly with great joy. Now, I know we're, none of us are really Greek scholars, but I will tell you that that last great in verse 10, they rejoice exceedingly with great joy. That word great in, in the Greek is a word that we still use today. You, you wanna, I'm, I'm going to teach you all a Greek word this morning. You know what the word great is in Greek? Mega. Mega. Say mega. Mega. You just all spoke the Greek. Congratulations. You, you're now Greek scholars. They rejoice exceedingly with mega joy. Now, I mean, we still use that word. It, was, was it a good party? Oh, it was a mega party. Was it a good member? Oh, it was a mega member. Uh, I mean, it, it was awesome. So there is real joy here. They knew what they were seeing. And they got it. They, they were happy to be there. They were seeing the advent of the greatest king ever. And they responded appropriately. And then finally, you see the face value of the story in worship. These men honored the Christ child. Verse 11 says that they fell to the ground and worshiped the child. And Greek the word worship means to do reverence. They were not afraid to come down off of their high horses and to humble themselves before the Lord. They knew what it meant to say, Lord, you are worthy. You are great. And we want to ascribe to you and show in our hearts and show in our worship that you are worthy of our time and our attention and our worship. So, so I, I hope you're seeing the bottom line here. We, we, I think when we read this story, we just don't pay attention to the fact that this story tells us that several men, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11, 12, made a difficult journey over the course of many days to worship Jesus with expensive offerings and they 
they did it with the right kind of heart attitude. Now that, y'all, that's quite a list. Time, bother, cost, attitude, and heart. Now, compare that to the typical modern experience of Christianity. Worshippers attend when it is convenient. Givers give when cajoled. Workers serve when pressured. And passion and joy are often absent from worship. We have in front of us a model for responding to Jesus. We have in front of us a model for how to experience faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but somehow, over the years, we've lost any focus on this story and its face value. We've gotten distracted by the trees so much to the point that we don't see the forest that's in front of us. How has that why is it that our modern experience is not like the experience that's recorded in Matthew chapter 2? How have we lost the model? I, I want to mention just four things this morning that I think are the reasons we've lost the model. And, and I think it's important especially for us at Christmas time to think about these issues so that we can recover the model, certainly at Christmas, but actually at every part of the year. Number one, I think we've lost the model because of a lack of personal, private prayer. The old scholar, J.C. Ryle, said, backsliding generally begins with the neglect of private prayer. And, and think about it, if we don't spend time talking with God, we naturally won't be interested in what He wants us to do or how he wants us to respond to him in our world. So if there's, a, if there's a problem in our exercise of Christianity, if there's a lack in the modern experience of Christianity versus the first century experience of Christianity, part of it, I think, is because of a lack of prayer. Number two, I, I think it's because of a lack of Bible reading. And, and I know we as a church have pushed in 2019, we have pushed, pushed, pushed reading through the Bible this last year. But I also understand that just because we have pushed it doesn't mean that everybody has actually done it. Now let me tell you, as your pastor, I am grateful, grateful, so grateful for those who have read through the Bible this year. And, and let me tell you, as your pastor, that I understand that those who uh, those who made an effort but maybe didn't get it all done or maybe missed some passages. And we're, we're all so busy. I understand that. And, and I don't have any bad feelings about that. And I hope you did as much as you could and benefited from it. But can I just tell you that also as your pastor, I just don't understand those who are even interested. The Bible is the Word of God. It's the light of God's voice and presence and wisdom in this world. Psalm 119 says that the Word is a lamp Listen to that. The word is a lamp unto my feet so that when the light of the Bible comes into your life, if it's a lamp in your life, when the light of the Bible comes into your life, the darkness has to go. And, and if you feel like you're in a dark place in your life, if you're not satisfied with your life, if you want to get out of the darkness, I'm telling you the best thing that you can do is develop a regular habit of reading and studying the Bible. I like what one preacher said, if you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. If you want to hear God speak audibly, read it out loud. It's the Word of God. Number three, I think if we have lost in our modern experience what was the experience of the first century, it's due to a lack of practice. Y'all, every time we withhold a bit of our heart in worship, in life, 
in service or in personal private devotions. Anytime we withhold even just a little bit of our heart, even, even when we pull back from what the Holy Spirit plants in our heart and says, this is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. This is what I have for you. Anytime we hold back from that, for whatever reason, and, and maybe in worship we don't sing out, uh, uh, you know, maybe we feel that's undignified. I actually, when I was a young person, uh, I, I tend to sing loud and not necessarily on key. Uh, when I was a young person, I actually had somebody sitting next to me in church say very critically, why do you sing so loud? Uh, because God is good. That's why. <laughs> because He loves me. Because He saved me. And, and if I'm undignified or all key, I don't care. I'm happy to do it. But for whatever reason, uh, you know, maybe we feel if, 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 if somehow, you know, sometimes God just speaks. God just moves. And, and you, you may feel, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cry. But I'm a man. I'm going to do something like that. Look, anytime we hold back, anytime we say, oh, no, I'm not going to get emotional. I'm not, I'm not going to get too dedicated. I, I, I'm not going to give. I'm not going to be extravagant. We can say, when we hold back, we miss out on what God wants to do in the opportunity that He wants to give us, in the experience that He wants to give us, in the joy that He wants to give us. And y'all can just tell you, if you miss out often enough, your heart gets cold. On the other hand, the more you surrender, the more you respond to what God's leading you to do, the closer you get and the more you enjoy the experience of your faith. Number four. Here's the bottom line. Lack of prayer. Lack of Bible study. Lack of practice. All of that builds to this one last point. If we have lost the joy in our modern experience of Christianity, it's because we have allowed lesser things to take higher place. And, and ultimately, a lack of prayer and a lack of Bible study and lack of practice are symptoms of this one thing. This is the thing. We have allowed lesser things to take higher place. There's an old hymn uh, in our hymnals. It's called Rise Up, O Men of God. Some of y'all might remember that. Rise Up. And, like I said, off key. Uh, but there's a line in that song. It, it, it says, Rise Up, O Men of God. Now listen to this. And, and the next line is, Have done with lesser things. I, my prayer, my hope, my desire is that as a people, believers, in this modern era, would have done with lesser things. I, I wish that would become the modern motto of, of Christianity. But the tendency is actually the opposite. We tend to let every little thing take the place of, listen to me, devotion to God, attendance in the house of God and time with God. And, and let me be plain about what happens. Anytime we let lesser things get in the way of being in church, being with God, or being involved in knowing God, we are making a serious personal mistake with our own lives and also with our families. The best Christmas present you can give your family this year 
is to teach them by regular habit in 2020 what it means to know and to love and to serve God. <coughs> Have done